Okay, today I'm going to be providing an update on the Canman 2 underground project, which is really on the cusp of becoming Australia's next copper mine. For those that aren't aware, uh, Canman 2 is located just out of Adelaide. It was mined as a series of open pits from 2011 to 2020. During that period, we produced about 137,000 tonnes of copper in concentrate and over 55,000 ounces in gold. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been drilling below the base of the extent of those open pits to demonstrate that we have a viable underground operation. And we have a cracking little project. Uh, late last year, we put out an economic study, suggested that we had uh, the first three years of our mine plan would throw off for about $200 million in free cash flow for a really low capital investment of only $26 million. Um, so that puts us as one of the lowest capital intensive copper production opportunities all around the world. Um, and this is not a bad little investment when you consider that our enterprise value at the moment is sitting about $33 million. So this project is fully permitted, uh, it's got all of the processing infrastructure um, in place and as you can see in the background photo here we've actually started some of the um, underground development works and already intersecting the high grade copper zones. So I've got a fair few slides today so I'm going to roll through this um, fairly quickly. Firstly, just a brief corporate snapshot. Um, as I said, $40 million market cap. Uh, we've got $7 million uh, in the tin at the moment, so an EV, $33 million. Um, the only other thing I really want to draw your attention to on this slide is that we hold about $220 million worth of carried forward tax losses, which obviously become very valuable as we get into operations to get that free cash flow rolling. And in addition to that, we hold $17 million in franking credits, which enables us to push out over $50 million in fully franked dividends. The operation is fully permit, permitted. Um, it sits about 55 kilometres um, out of Adelaide. We have excellent um, access to market down at Port Adelaide, just a 70k uh, roll down the hill um, on the southeastern freeway. We are supported by an excellent government regime there in South Australia. In fact, they gave us $2 million last year to start that underground works that you saw on the opening slide. Um, so this is really a genuine tier one investment jurisdiction. Being based in the uh, the Adelaide Hills, we don't have um, any issues about attracting a workforce. Uh, in fact, uh, recently we put out an expression of interest as we were gearing up to, to get this underground underway and we were just overwhelmed with the response from uh, experienced um, and, and skilled operators and technical professionals all wanting to be involved in an operation where you can work a mining roster, get a mining pay, but get home every night. And we have an excellent relationship with the uh, local communities in Cayman 2 and Callington. <coughs> and this has been born out of about 20 years worth of um, engagement with the community. So it started at the, the initial uh, open pit exploration stage, all through the open pit operations, and obviously now as we're starting to develop the underground. We've always approached it with a community first type culture, and in particular spent a lot of time um, making sure that we align our project um, development opportunities as well as our rehabilitation um, works with what the community sort of regional master plan was trying to achieve. So by way of example, we've now got 122 hectares of land under rehabilitation, all with native seeds, and that all connects with a broader regional green belt um, and we're now in the process of still producing um, surplus native seed which we provide to all the local uh, farmlands etc around the area so they can expand this initiative and this is all in line with the, the master planning process. As these type of activities which um, have enabled Hillgrove to be consistently held up as one of the best in industry, uh, bottom left there you can see the community group there just receiving yet another award from the, the Premier of the state there with regards to um, excellence in working with the community. Um, we at the start of this year, we actually released our first sustainability report. So we really rolled up a lot of these, uh, I guess, ESG activities that we'd been undertaking for 20 years and put them within a globally recognised framework, the GRI framework. We've mapped that as well to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the ICMM as well. And we're really proud of this work that we've been doing and encourage everyone to um, either come along to the booth, learn more about that, um, or to actually download this document from, uh, from the website. All the infrastructure that we need is already in place. This includes a 3.6 million tonne per annum processing plant. Now we've maintained this so it can restart very quickly with very little refurbishment costs. So maintain the power contracts, the water contracts. We pump water through the entire system on a daily basis. We fire up the uh, crushing system, the conveying system on a weekly basis, inch to mill. So this is ready to go. We also hold a lot of critical spares. So we've got uh, mill motors, gearbox, trunnions, pinions, uh, crusher swing stock, basically anything you need to mitigate any type of operational um, delays. So it's really, ready for a quick restart with very low refurbishment costs. 
In addition to that, we've got a permitted tails dam. Now, this tails dam has um, enough capacity permitted that's double the current mine plan at the moment. So as we continue to drill, expand those resources, grow the mine plan, um, it can all be housed within the permitted tails dam that we have. The pit itself is also a key infrastructure asset. It's around 60 metres deep. Um, the de the, the uh, ramp system itself acts basically as a decline, so we can get in at the bottom of that as we have and uh, basically access those loads for very low development time and cost associated with that. Um, as I talked about, we have started um, with the development. We've got two portals in place at the moment. And by starting those portals and getting that done before we've hit the FID point, what it's enabled us to do is also set up the infrastructure underground as well. So we've got ventilation fans, we've got water down there, got uh, electricity down the bottom, fuel storage, uh, crib facilities, ablution, uh, emergency response is already set up. And that really facilitates a rapid restart once we can complete off the uh, project financing stage. So this is a picture of the underground, as we expected when we got in, very competent uh, rock mass in there. And having that hard rock really just facilitates um, low ground support requirements and, and, uh, and the ability to really turn these um, faces over quickly to get that production profile up. And 13 metres in, we hit the high grade chuck pyrite. Um, and so we've yeah, obviously mined that, stuck it on the ROM, and it's ready sitting there for future processing once we get underway. In December last year, we put out our first economic study, um, and that basically has got the, the, the key, uh, I guess, uh, highlights of the study there on the page. But I think the thing I really wanted to highlight is that it, it is a low capital requirement to get in. Uh, all the sustaining cost is excellent. Uh, it's only seven months when we start to when we turn the mill on, and then only another seven months until that uh, payback uh, of that initial capital is complete. So really uh, nice little project. But importantly, since that study was put out, we've continued to drill for the next 12 months. We've actually grown the resource by another 21% so another 1.2 million tonnes, it's not in these figures, and I uh, fully expect that as we roll that into an updated mine plan, it'll uh, improve the economics uh, even further. But given that we have all of the infrastructure already in place, uh, it's only $26 million to get up and running. So that actually puts us as one of the lowest uh, copper, uh, well, lowest capital um, copper development, uh, copper development uh, projects within the world. This is a graph that was produced by AME in 2017, basically looked at all of the uh, global uh, copper development opportunities there. And you sort of see ours right over on the left-hand side in orange, we're in order of magnitude lower in our capital requirements to get this up and running uh, per annual copper uh, tonne that's produced. That's a key, uh, key competitive advantage for us. Uh, when the plan was put together, and, and released at, uh, in December last year, the cop price was sitting about $13,500 in Australian um, terms per tonne. So, you know, uh, if you like, $6 per pound in Australian terms. And at that point, we were throwing off about $200 million in free cash in, this, in the first three years, MPV around uh, $166 million, IRR about 389%. Now, since that time, the price actually came off um, a little bit, um, but what I've done here is just basically put together a slide just to demonstrate that under basically any price point, we have a very robust project here, um, currently sitting about $12,500 per tonne, but this here is uh, basically our cumulative cash flow uh, projection over the first uh, three years. And you see under any pricing point, uh, it's got a very quick payback and generating uh, plenty of cash. When the price did come off in June, unfortunately, yeah, our share price, like many other juniors, was hit pretty hard. We're about half of what we were uh, prior to that, and it hasn't actually bounced back um, yeah, as, the, as the copper price has rallied. Now, that obviously presents you know, a, a, what we believe is a very undervalued stock, an excellent investment opportunity. But with the price coming back now, um, what, what, what it uh, has done is enables us to get our project financing right back on track, and uh, we're now in a position where we're speaking with a number of uh, groups to, to uh, basically conclude that uh, project finance so we can get started in the near future. As we're working through that final project financing stage, um, we're continuing to drill on site. So just taking you through the drilling, in the past three years, we've drilled 122 holes and we've had 143 intersections of positive or economic uh, grade and widths. This is over 100% strike rate, which is good going uh, by, by any measure. And importantly, Every time we've run a drilling program, it's converted to additional resources. So the timeline down the bottom here is just sort of showing in 2019, we had about a million tonnes. Uh, we did a program in 2020, double that to 2.2, continued drilling in 2021, double that again to 5.7. That's the stage when we said, like, let's stop, let's put out this first economic study, the $200 million plan. Um, and then since then, we've continued to, to drill at about another 20%, uh, which is obviously not in that economic study at this point, but would fully expect that as we roll that through, um, that, that that'll enhance the economics even further. 
When I look at, uh, I guess, the high expiration success rate and then the fact that that always converts into an increase in the mineral resources and then have a look at the opportunities we have on site, it's, it's really quite exciting proposition to, to grow the, the mine plan, both from an annual throughput point of view, as well as a, a mine life extension point of view. So just illustrating this a little bit further, on the left hand side here, it's a long section looking through the grey areas, they're the open pits that were mined down to depth, all the coloured holes there, some drill hole intercepts, you can see most of the drilling has actually been done directly below uh, the main pit there. But the, the stage one mine plan um, that I spoke about earlier, that's really contained within those black boxes. So it only goes down about 250 metres below the base of the pit. But you can see we've got a lot of positive drilling results well outside of that. In fact, all the way down to 500 metres below surface, we have you know, three metres at five grams per tonne gold and 1.1% copper. So at the moment, the mine plan uh, really just considers two of nine known loads have either been drilled or uh, mined as part of the open pit period, and all of them remain open, both long strike and down dip. So one of the areas we're looking at directly below the, the mine here is, is Kavanagh, what we call the Kavanagh load system. This is where we will start. So we had excellent intercepts through here, like 170 metres of 1% copper. Uh, but traditionally, or generally what we're seeing in this area is about 10 to 30 metres true width, anywhere between 1 to 3% copper equivalent. And that's what will really uh, be the focus of the mine as we get into production. In Nugent, um, this was another area that we drilled, particularly last year, we had that uh, we added about 6,000 uh, tonnes of contained copper metal, which is currently not in the economic study. Um, and just for, for context, on the right-hand side here, what you can see is uh, the Nugent pits. This was mined in 2015 to a depth of about 100 metres. All the pink holes there up the top, they're grade control holes over 0.8% copper. The area in blue below, that's the, the underground resource model that was used for the economic study. But all of the uh, red dots with the yellow labels, they're all... Uh, economic drill hole intercepts, which have obviously grown the, they've grown the uh, resource, but they haven't yet been put into the mine plan. So as they roll into the mine plan, it will grow in Nugent and improve the economics of that area further. So in addition to the Nugent and Kavanagh depth and strike uh, extension opportunities that I've just spoken about, we also have two more areas, South Hub and North Hub. So just firstly, South Hub, Basically, um, it's a collection of three areas, uh, Emily Star Pit, Cr uh, Critchley and Paringa. Emily Star was mined to a depth of about 100 metres at the same time as Nugent, about 2015. Still open at depth all the way through there. We are currently drilling in that area now with the intent to try and bring that into an initial maiden resource and then get it into that early stage mine plan. But we're following up on some really, really nice intersections. So some of the deepest holes we've got there, uh, particularly in Paringa, 17 metres, 3.6% copper, 0.6 grams per tonne gold, nothing drilled below it. So they're the areas we're really trying to follow up on to make sure that we can bring these into an economic resource and then uh, get them into the mine plan. At the other end, we have North Hub. North Hub, again, a collection of a couple of areas, North Kavanagh and Coopers. Uh, we did touch on uh, North Kavanagh very briefly as we came down the open pit, but it's quite a steeply dipping, uh, relatively narrow ore body, so not really appropriate for open pit mining, but perfect for underground, basically uh, about uh, yeah, 8 to 12, 15 metres in uh, true width, anywhere between 1.8, 2.1%. Uh, copper, we have about uh, 200 metres of strike uh, confirmed there, down to about 100 metres in depth. We've only put one hole that's a bit deeper at the moment, down to 300 metres in depth, and that is showing that mineralisation still continues all the way through. Um, so as the drilling finishes in South Hub, we'll roll into North Hub with, again, the intent of growing the resource further um, and then uh, bringing that ultimately into the mine plan. And it, obviously, as we can bring these work areas into a mine plan, it, it has a material impact on the project economics. So what we did as part of our drill hole targeting was just dummy up a, a relatively conceptual plan, uh, but it's all based on the, uh, I guess, the exploration holes we have today and projecting you know, what we are anticipating on seeing there. But what it really highlighted is that going from two work areas, that is Nugent and Kavanagh, to four work areas, which would be including South and North Hub, you can bring these additional work areas in for very uh, low additional fixed charges. So it's just really the, low, the, the incremental cost of bringing these areas in. And that has a material impact to uh, basically the, the project free cash flows. So really looking forward to um, completing this drilling off and uh, getting these into some sort of form that we can wrap a, uh, a compliant resource around uh, and, and really get them into the mine plan because we believe that that'll be a huge value increase at that point in time. And as we bring those in, the 3.6 million tonne per annum mill, we're only utilising about 40% of that. So we can actually bring those tonnes in for very, very low incremental cost just by utilising that latent capacity. So I guess just in summary, it's a very unique value uh, opportunity. It's, it's low risk, it's low cost, it has a very quick um, time to first copper production. 
In addition to that, there's plenty of upside. I mean, there's already 1.2 million tonnes that we've drilled, proven up into a resource that hasn't rolled through into the mine plan, the economic study. But beyond that, we have these other areas, South Hub, North Hub, which we're actively drilling at the moment and would fully expect them to come into future mine plans. Um, and with the ability to, I guess, uh, have all of the existing infrastructure in place and be able to put it into production relatively quickly, um, we uh, basically believe that we are in a really good position to become Australia's next copper mine. And uh, with an EV of $33 million, I think this is, represents yeah, exceptional value. So if you'd like to learn more, got the booth straight out the outside there and uh, be really love to talk to you guys in more detail. Thanks very much.